shoot. Well, welcome everybody. Um, hopefully you had a nice lunch and a little, little break um, and played some trivia. This is the GIS in Action Session 5, uh, talking kind of all about COVID today. So um, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A feature on the right-hand side of your screen to ask questions. We have a moderator who will be keeping track of those to ask our presenters in the end. Um, today, we are starting off with Nicole Eden from the Arizona um, Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, she will be talking about discharging COVID hospital patients. So if you um, will give her a round of virtual applause, we will um, get started on our presentation. Again, use the chat and question features along the side of your screen. If you have any questions for Nicole as things go on, um, Nicole, if you want to get started, I will stop sharing my screen and you can share yours. Okay. Yes. Let me share my screen and let me know. Oh, shoot. Um, sorry. Okay, do you see my screen? Yes. Um, hang on. We also see your internet thing at the top, if that matters. Um, my speaker notes are not here. If you, if you close out, Nicole, I press the escape button probably. Um, and I apologize, I had this all set up before. This is not, yeah. oh my gosh, I'm sorry. I had everything like totally set up. It's okay, I think that you have to present in a different way and there's an option when you okay. start it. I have them now. Do you see my screen? Yes, we see the packed screen. With the little green nurse? No, we see the post acute care capacity tracker screen. I, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I went through all of this. Um, Cole, this is Teresa. I'm just going to make one suggestion. When you mm -hmm. share your screen, make sure you're sharing your actual screen or desktop or display and not just a window. So as Mariah pointed out, you might want to stop sharing for a moment and then reshare and make sure you share the actual desktop that you want us to see. Thank you. I appreciate that. Now, are you seeing... Oh my gosh. Okay. Can I just... Okay, are you seeing now the little green nurse? Yes. Yes. And a title page? Yeah. Okay. All right. Perfect. I am so sorry about that. I went through this like three times. Anyway, we'll jump right into it because I know time is uh, ticking. Is there a way I can get rid of, you see the controls up here? All right. We cannot see our controls. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Um, then I, okay. All right. After all of that. <laughs> Hard to believe I work in technology, sorry about that. But anyway, good afternoon. My name is Nicole Leiden and I'm a senior GIS analyst in our informatics and business intelligence office. And I'm so excited to be here to present on a little 
something that we've been working on since May 2020. Um, back in the plenary, Frank Winters asked us to reflect on things that we think that we're good at and what we're proud of. Um, and I was kind of thinking about this and I'm like, hey, I'm pretty proud about this pact, um, this application that we built. I'm really good at taking creative approaches to applying GIS to real world problems. And very proud of it, of the application that we built and the impact that we're making on people's lives in Arizona. So just to start out with, we're, we're GIS people. Um, and we're usually working with a question of where, and that question of where typically involves a map. Like say we use GIS to inventory natural resources. We use GIS and maps to uh, map out crimes and 911 call data. If you're a company like FedEx, you could use a map to establish um, the best delivery routes and monitor your vehicles. Um, maybe you're in real estate and you're using GIS to manage your properties. Um, or I'm from Minnesota and a lot of farmers back where I'm from are using GIS and GPS um, to apply fertilizers correctly um, in precision agriculture. And all of those things involve maps. During COVID-19 at Health Services, we created a system to answer a different type of where question to flatten lives or to save lives and flatten the curve. So um, I don't know if flatten the curve became a part of everybody's lexicon in America in the early spring of 2020. Um, but certainly did at the health department. I'm new to public health and it was a completely new term to me. So just an overview of the graph here, you can see in the red dotted line marks the healthcare system capacity. That is how many beds and how many staff, how many nurses, nurses doctors that they have um, their capacity for people coming into um, healthcare, and specifically, we're talking about hospitals right now. When the coronavirus was first discovered um, and made its way to America from Wuhan, China, um, everybody at Health Services, Justine, um, you know, most people get mild to moderate respiratory illnesses and they re can recover, they can care for their sy symptoms at home. But for thousands of Americans and people around the world, COVID caused severe acute respiratory syndrome, and it's characterized by coughing, shortness of breath, low oxygen levels, which cause you to lose speech mobility, become confused, even go into cardiac arrest. This is a very life-threatening emergency and requires immediate a medical attention. Um, so people are going to emergency departments, intensive care units. Without protective measures, the curve that you see in the pink is what everybody was worried about that was gonna far exceed healthcare system capacity. All the whole goal of all the public health measures is to flatten out that curve. So to put into place protective measures, mitigation measures to help flatten that curve into the gray area that you see there so that the healthcare systems don't get overwhelmed. Um, and there are things, you know, initially it was things like you learn in kindergarten, first grade, you know, uh, wash your hands a lot, don't sneeze on people, um, stay home if you're sick. Um, but we kind of found out like that wasn't going to be enough. And so I'll give the example of what happened in New York City in in spring of 2020, New York City was the early epicenter of COVID-19, of the crisis in the United States. In a three month period, over 200,000 people tested positive for COVID-19 and a lot of people died, 18,000 people died. You can see that surge right there. Um, there were a couple of weeks there that 7,800 people were dying. Um, mostly a lot of the people had heart disease, they had type two diabetes. Um, it was a particularly bad day in April where 803 people died. <clears throat> um, and there were hospitals that they were having multiple deaths a day and their emergency rooms, you know, it would, it would be a 500 bed hospital and 
200 people sitting in the waiting room and having horrible time breathing, cardiac arrest, like worst case. <laughs> um, and they were running out of supplies that they didn't have enough ventilators. The Navy even sailed one of their hospital ships into New York Harbor to provide more healthcare capacity to the hospitals. Um, it got so bad when you think about 18,000 people dying, it's only in addition to healthcare system capacity, there's also capacity for morgues and funeral homes. And they were pulling in refrigerated trucks and using those to house decedents. So this was pretty bad. Um, so in Arizona, kind of with, you know, looking at, oh my gosh, what's going on in New York City? This could happen here in Arizona, even though we didn't see the huge rise in cases until the summer. Um, in in uh, on March 11th, the governor declared a public health emergency. March 15th, schools were closed. March 17th, they canceled events, 10 or more people. Started recommending that people telework, stay at home. Um, they closed bars, gyms, put in mask mandates. Um, and all of these were measures to you know, flatten that curve basically keep things in that area of the gray line below the red dot line and not get into that area of the, of the pink curve. Um, so we're all familiar with like protective measures like these, but there was a lot of things that were going on behind the scenes. These are the things I think that the general public is aware of, um, but there were other things that we were working on at health services. One of the things that we implemented was the Arizona surge line also serve as a curve flattener, activated in April 21st, 2020. And what, what it was is all of the hospital systems, all of the public, private, federal hospital systems in Arizona came together and said, we need to work together. Because when surge happens, when people start experiencing all of those horrible life-threatening symptoms of COVID, respiratory distress, cardiac arrest, they need to get care. All of the hospitals don't experience those surges the same way. So you could have a hospital like completely overwhelmed and you could have a hospital, you know, 20 miles up the road, maybe even, you know, a few miles away. So what they came to, what they came to do, the purpose of the surge line was for to have a place where hospitals could call in 24 seven and say, hey, we are experiencing a surge. We are starting to reach the point where we, aren't, we don't have emergency department beds. We don't have ICU beds. Can you help us out? Do you have capacity? They agreed. Um, it was pretty cool that they all came together they all agreed to report in key metrics related to capacity. So things like bed avail availability in the emergency departments, in the ICUs, if they had inpatient beds. And then they also agreed, hey, if I have space and the Arizona surge line contacts us, that we will rapidly place those transferred patients. So the system was working really well to load balance, kind of even out the demand among the hospitals, but COVID is a, is a complex illness. And even though you might recover enough to be discharged from a hospital, you might need ongoing care even after you've left say, the ICU. Um, and we really, they really can't keep patients in ICU because there's people behind them that really, really need those beds. They're experiencing cardiac arrest, respiratory um, emergencies. So, and they, and actually the hospitals were all reporting into a central hub. So that was working well. But the hospitals were having a really hard time and Arizona Surge Line was having a really hard time transferring those COVID patients to lower levels of care, whether 
what we are ca called post-acute care facilities. Um, so the hospitals had a central hub, but what we really needed was a central hub for all those post-acute care facilities, like the skilled nursing facilities, inpatient rehab centers, home health agencies, long-term care hospitals. We needed a place for them to report the capacity. I mean, the good news is that Arizona has plenty of those post-acute care providers where people could go to recover more fully. It was just we didn't know what their capacity was. Um, oh, and we needed to develop something like really, really, really fast because that surge in June was coming upon us pretty quick. So the other, you know, luckily, when we were seeing all that, what was happening in New York City with all the deaths, um, that in late March, even before we started working on PACT um, and the problem of the post-acute care facilities reporting, we had convened a task team, a fatality management task team and it, with state and county emergency responders. We had the county MEs there, hospital morgues were represented. And then we also had the director of the Arizona Board of Funeral Directors and Embalmers attend these meetings. And we met once a week, if not twice a week on different issues. Um, but one of the issues is that they needed a way to monitor the COVID-19 death surges. Um, and they were gonna do that by um, asking funeral homes, what is your capacity to intake decedents from the hospital? We also had them report on, are they experienced any surge risks related to staffing? Are they having staff get sick and now they can't transport, they can't come up over and pick up decedents from the hospitals to be transferred to a funeral home. So we were really fortunate that we had all of that in place. And what we basically did almost was make a carbon copy to develop the post-acute care capacity tracker. And here is what the landing page of that looks like um, with everything shown. And I do have to say, I think that we probably used every Esri app um, everything that's offered in ArcGIS online, we probably made use of it somewhere. So it was really nice to have all these ready to use tools as a software as a service, to be able to quickly put together PACT. I mean, we, we had already done it for fatality management. Now we could do it for post-acute care. We actually developed all of this um, in about three days, three to four days. So. I'm going to walk through a little bit of how we developed the surveys, the operations dashboard, and the hub initiative, basically everything that you see here. Okay, so step one in building this, we needed information from the post-acute care facilities. Now, as a state, we can't just go out and ask these private businesses um, hey, we got like this little project. We need to know your capacity. We need to know if you're going to take COVID patients um, and sort of monitor your situation a little bit. Um, so what was nice is that, and this was such a, a super important thing in contributing to flattening that curve, that the governor's office came out with this executive order that essentially gave us the authority to collect information on whether or not they were accepting COVID, COVID positive patients, what their criteria was for admitting new patients, what the number of beds were that they had available. Um, this is the second of an executive order related to PACT. The first one came out in May. Um, this one is from June, but but that one also authorized us to collect information. What are the number of ventilators that you have? Um, and part of it, you know, was to help the hospitals, help the Arizona surge line 
do that interfacility transfer of patients who need lower levels of care. But the other part is that the state of Arizona was acquiring ventilators um, and other medical equipment that the hospitals needed. And it was a way to say, you know, um, to monitor, hey, it looks like you're getting low on ventilators. Can we send some ventilators to you? Um, that's just one example. We were also putting out um, personal protective equipment. Um, so not only asking about their ability and do you have beds available to transport people, but what medical equipment do you have to be able to give the best care to these, to these patients. So we used survey one, two, three, super quick and easy. You know, took an hour to put in a few questions, publish it up, boom, we've got a survey. <clears throat> the next step of it is, okay, so because we've got data, we're collecting data from the facilities. Now we need a way to get that data to the hospitals and to the Arizona surge line so that they can use that information to be able to transfer patients. Um, so here's the dashboard that we built with data submitted by the post-acute care facilities. And um, originally this was only going, access to this dashboard was only, only going to be for um, our HELC folks and the Arizona surge line, but because of the great park, partnerships and the working relationships that we had established with the hospital systems, we actually opened up access directly to the hospitals um, so that they could access the dashboards themselves. So now that they don't have to call the Arizona surge line um, and have them look up information that they could just look up themselves. Uh, and I, I do wanna mention um, the little, I circled around the data, download data in Excel, and I'm just kind of laughing about it a little bit because I was over at DEMA doing an exercise, um, a drill exercise with Eric Shreve, and we were having a conversation about how can we get these emergency preparedness people to stop using spreadsheets and get them to use these beautiful interactive, you know, information at a glance uh, dashboards that we were building. Um, but yet <laughs> several people still wanted the ability to download that data into Excel. So we, we automated it. We developed a Python script and it gets published in puts here and then they can download the data um, into Excel. Okay, the last little bit of this was, okay, now we've got an application where people are reporting and we've got another application where the hospitals can see the information, can see the data that's being collected. Um, a wrinkle in all of this is the post-acute care facilities didn't want other post-acute care facilities to be able to see their data. So we had to get a little bit creative and limit access so that they could only see their own submissions. There's a way to do it in survey one, two, three, but we had to take it a little bit step further and actually pre-populate the creator field. Um, so we ahead of time generated usernames for their accounts and associated it with that record. And that's how we limited. So if you sign in as this person, you have three facilities and you only see your three facilities and not all 1200 plus. <clears throat> and then the dashboards, Wanted, I mean, the people who view the dashboards, of course, they want to see everybody's data because they're trying to um, move people who have recovered enough to be moved to a lower level of care. They want to see all that information. Um, and so it was really easy in Hub to develop um, groups. And based on your membership in these groups, it limits uh, what applications and which areas of PAC that you have access to. Um, and then with the dashboards, it was super easy to spin off other dashboards and modify the survey, spin up other dashboards like the home health, um, the isolated alternative care sites, develop a group, put people into that group. So only those that needed to see that information data would see it. 
pretty straightforward to you. And this was like pretty much all out of the box, commercial off the shelf. We did have to develop a custom web application and Python scripts to automate the processes where we could. Um, if you can imagine you're trying to onboard and create accounts for 1200 facilities. I mean, I spent the month of June, 2020 being packed help desk, generating accounts, being the tier one customer support for all of this, we were completely swamped and overwhelmed. So in July of 2020, we developed this custom web application where facilities can go, they can register for their account, they fill out the user agreement, which was very important to our attorneys, um, that this information was only to be used for the intended pur purposes and not for any other use. That was super important to our attorneys. So we built that right in into the um, custom web application. One of the trickier parts was actually um, getting a preloaded or getting a master list of sorts from our licensing bureau. Um, in that executive order, it uh, listed out all the different types of facilities that we could ask information from. Um, and it ended up being <laughs> well over a thousand, but that was like a little bit challenging because they had to go through line by line. Yes, yes, no, yes, yes, they should be reporting. No, they shouldn't be reporting. So we got that preloaded list into SQL Server database, displays in this JavaScript application. So they can go in there, fill out their information, select their facilities, and then to automate it, every hour we have a Python script that automatically generates that username and emails it to the user who just registered. Every night we use the Python script that creates I, if you've ever created added members to like ArcGIS Online or community from a file, I think you know what I'm talking about, like the first name, last name, email, username, password. Um, we, we developed a script that would just automate and publish that, do all of that for us. Um, the one manual thing that we still need to do is republish a feature class that contains those newly registered facilities. We didn't put all 1200 facilities into that feature class right off the bat. They do have to register. And then every morning uh, we have maintenance time and we <clears throat> add them. Okay, so, you know, we're feeling like pretty good about this. We've got a successful system. We're onboarding people, hundreds of people. Everything's going, you know, pretty smooth and everything. And um, we think it's a success. I mean, from a GIS, you know, kind of inside the internal walls, like this, this seems like a great thing, but how is it? Is it effective in the real world? And so we put out a survey. Um, I think it was the months, I wanna say September through December, maybe August through December asking, the hospitals, how effective is this? And they answered, I mean, we were pretty pleased to see, you know, that on average, they were using PAC five, five days a week on average. So it kind of be, had become an integral um, part of their process when they were discharging patients. And they were helping 11.4 patients per day at each facility to help place those patients to those lower levels of care when they no longer needed to be in an ICU, which frees up hospital beds. Um, on average, the length of hospital stays was reduced, you know, 1.6. Um, Maybe it doesn't seem like a lot, but it kind of is a lot if you're if you're really trying to keep people in that gray area, keep them in that curve, you know, flatten the curve um, and not overwhelm the hospitals. Um, I was always kind of like a straight A student, so when I saw this, I was like, "What? Six point seven? Why did we get a D? You know, out of ten? 
Um, so we did ask questions about how PAC could be improved. Again, this is data from last December, 2020, and they had some suggestions there. Um, and we actually put some of those into, into place um, where we created more accounts for frontline staff to be able to view the dashboards, not have to rely so heavily on the supervisors. And we did expand it to the um, long-term acute care hospitals and inpatient we have facilities and hospice, so. Um, hey, Nicole, this is Teresa. Yeah. We're at four o'clock, we're at the top of the hour. So I'm gonna have everyone that's listening right now who's put your questions in, if you could uh, send those questions to Nicole separately uh, at the end of this presentation, uh, Mariah will let you know all that. So if I could have you wrap it up in one minute, I'd appreciate you it, Nicole. Thank you I so much. And I know we had some technical issues at the yeah. beginning, so I was giving yeah. you a couple extra I'm minutes sorry, for sure. I was watching, yeah, the time no there. Wor okay. No worries, no worries. Thank you so much. I can do it. The, um, this is like last slide. So here's here's where we are in the it, today. This is data um, that I pulled yesterday from our data dashboards there on the website. And you can see that, you know, okay, there's, you know, the red, um, especially in the inpatient beds and the intensive care units that it's not, okay, so what we're really concerned about right there is the light gray. Look at how tiny that light gray is. That's the healthcare system capacity. Um, and so we re, the governor's office reenacted the executive order. It had been sunsetted in June. Um, they just reenacted that a couple of weeks ago, reauthorizing PACT and all of the reporting that goes with it. Um, so anyway, not exactly, you know, traditional sense of GIS where things are happening, but it did help the hospitals in the state of Arizona know where to place those patients into lower levels of care and keep us flatten that, you know, keep us under um, that healthcare system capacity and flatten the curve. And of course, the best way to flatten the curve is to go get a vaccine. <laughs> so shout out to the 4.2 million people in Arizona who have, who have done that and done their part to keep, you know, to flatten that curve and to really help out the hospital systems um, so that those who maybe they get in a car accident or have a heart attack, that when they go to the hospital, that they can get the care that that they need. And that is it. I'm sorry, I went a little bit over. Thank you, Nicole. Great presentation. Yes, yeah, so I know we had a couple of technical difficulties at the beginning, um, but thank you for your presentation. Um, if you could stop sharing, we'll move on to our next guest. We have David Moss who is the Director of GIS Strategic Enterprise Planning at Sidwell. Um, David, again, oh, this is, we'll be presenting on coverage related information and there's his smiling face. So David, why don't you take us over? All right, so let me share my screen. Okay, and I will go. And I'm going to flip this quick. Okay. All right. So uh, if you guys not don't know me, I was the director of data management and GIS at Maricopa County. And I'm happy to be here today. And I just kind of want to go through some of our COVID-19 uh, response with the GIS team that was there. I've been at Sidwell for the last three months. So I still thought it was important to share some of these different strategies and things that we had going on there. A lot of you guys may have seen our actual, the different apps for the schools and the different things that we put on the Maricopa site. but. You know, that was the, the awesome part of it, but there was a lot that went into that years prior to make sure our system was set up and we could handle that type of surge. And I do know moving forward, they're doing a great job there at the county to make sure that if we have another pandemic, you know, we'll have even better moving forward. 
So part of this presentation is really to not only give you some things that we did, but also help you and your, how you move forward in your GIS so that you can take some of those lessons learned that we had and apply that to how you manage your GIS and things like that. So therefore you can be uber successful moving forward. So one of, I'm a big quote person. So uh, one of my favorite quotes is, um, and I hope you guys can see this. Can you guys see this? Or are you seeing my stuff blocking the screen? There we go. All right, one of my biggest quotes uh, that I am, I am into is uh, by Will Smith, if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. And all that means is understanding, like we understood that at some point GIS was gonna be very used in, in the public eye even more than it was, but we didn't think it was gonna be a pandemic, but we had an actual strategy on where we wanted to go in the future and the things we we're gonna look at. We also knew our, the different strengths and weaknesses, personalities and skills of our employees, right? Some employees do very well in front of like a presentation type mode. Others were very good in getting the work done, but not you know, presenting in front of the public or presenting in front of a room of directors and things like that. Also as a GIS manager or a leader, you wanna make sure you put every employee in a position to be successful, right? If you know their strengths and weaknesses, then you can place them in areas where they can shine and be uber successful. I, I was elected to be the IT liaison for the whole IT department with public health. So all IT requests, GIS and otherwise, I got to examine, look at, and then inform the IT group how we were gonna work with public health to make that move forward. Well, I couldn't be in every meeting. So that means we had multiple meetings with our public health group that our other team members attended with directors or high level managers, and they had to be comfortable in those type of meetings and settings. So when it's a slow period, not as much, you know, it is a little bit more now, but when it's, that's the time you wanna help develop your staff. So then when you are, you know, racing against time to do things, your staff is already to, ready to be successful. You don't wanna do that during a, you know, during that time. Also integrate your employee career goals in their development. And not just, oh, here's your development of working at the state or the county or the city, but what do you wanna do in your career? Sometimes the career goals may not match up, but what that does is if you help that employee, you're helping the overall well-being of the employee. So therefore, they're going to do even greater work for you while they're there and they don't feel like they don't have any growth and what they want to do or you don't care about where they want to do in their career. Also have a great you know, relationship with your vendors and use your partners. Um, we had a great relationship with our partners and we were having weekly meetings every so often with our different partners to make sure as they brought new technologies out um, or with Esri or with Eagle View that we could take advantage of those as needed you know, during the pandemic and also have a succession plan. Now, I do know that's kind of, that may be a, a word that you know, folks don't wanna hear sometimes in HR, but it's a very important, right? Because as it's shown during the last year, we have folks get sick, family members pass away, you know, employees pass away, and if you didn't have a succession plan, even if it's not written down, of like who's gonna be the next person up, and they do that like in sports, you know, next person up, right? In sports, we had to make sure we had that because we had situations where people got sick or left, and then it's like, okay, who's gonna take over that? Did we have everything documented really well? Did we know how that operated? And you don't wanna be doing that during the pandemic. You wanna have that all worked out beforehand. So part of our strategy uh, was we had this particular vision that the, the team had put together. Now this is from two, 2018 and I show this because it was 2018 when we did this. So we're looking at things in 2019 and we have some of our managers uh, names on there looking at those things. 2020, those things really didn't happen. Why? Because the pandemic happened. And of course, 2021 changed what that was, but we, we knew and you know, high level where we wanted to go. So things were planned around that. So then when things happen, of course you go on just and they're making new ones uh, moving forward, a new vision, but you, want, you need to know where you're going or attempting to go. So that way as things adjust, you know how to adjust it and you're not just taking tickets. 
You know, a lot of times GIS folks and team, teams can be just taking tickets. They don't know where the final stop is or where they're going down the road. And you don't want to do that. You can end up spending more money and more time uh, redoing work by not knowing that. Also, the environment, we had a really great environment there with everything scoped out. And I'm big on metrics. One of the things I like about metrics was if you showcase metrics, then you're having a discussion about the metrics and not whether the person likes you as a leader or likes your team. And in this case, you know, we always like to highlight what our availability was because if somebody came and said, well, David, we see you saying 99.5, but your system was down last week for three hours and this and that. I'm like, okay, great. You want uh, five nines? Well, okay, we could do five nines. Here's the cost associated with that. Would you like to pay for that? Would you like to help us pay for that? Well, now it's a discussion of, am I okay with three hours downtime or do I not want three hours downtime? And guess what? If your customers don't want it, they will cover the cost. But we wanted to showcase this during the good times. So when things did go down during the bad times, it was a discussion of, well, we never seen this number and we only see it now that you had an outage. No, we would show that constantly. Also our public availability site that they had at the county uh, we had that up um, so that way other folks using our services could see how well we were performing so they can trust in our services and take advantage of those. Also, one thing is, is you want to know your security, right, to a high level, how you're doing your security in GIS and in IT, because that was a big component when we was working with public health, was we wanted them to trust that we were securing their data and we're taking, you were doing everything in our power to make sure it didn't get leaked out. Because as you may have saw, there were some people quit or got fired because data got leaked to the public that shouldn't have. So we wanted to make sure they understood how we took advantage. And we have a terminal operator certification for certain staff. And when you had that at the staff with the FBI uh, fingerprinting, then you could access certain servers. If you didn't have that, you couldn't access those servers. And so also this, when we share this with directors and leaders, it's like, wow, this is a great diagram. If you took the time to make it look so good and put it together, then you must be doing those things. And so that builds trust. So then when it comes time to us housing data for everybody that got you know, the vaccine or tested negative or positive for COVID cases, they can feel at ease because we've built that trust up over time or even building up during COVID. Now, this was uh, these are the numbers by the numbers when, uh, when I took these in March, um, about a month before I, I left. And so, as you can see, we did over 50 apps, dashboards, and surveys. We're getting these type of hits, you know, since August. Um, and so, we're definitely over, you know, they're definitely over the 2 million at this point. And we're doing a million vaccine and COVID cases a map per week. Uh, they're close to 2 million now. And then over 250,000 new vaccine points a week as well being mapped. And just think about, it, right, you're doing all this data. And one of the cool things was is, Sometimes there's folks that didn't know how enterprise GIS was. And we were able to showcase this. And I like to use this to show, I would use this to showcase of our leadership is we are enterprise because only an enterprise system can produce this amount of data and, and weeks. Also with the downloads, we worked with ArcGIS Online to have certain things on ArcGIS Online versus on our network. So then our internet edge wouldn't take the brunt of all those downloads of data, right? And guess what? People are going to continue wanting to download that data. Well, now our networking team was happy because we were looking out for them as well. We were looking out for the network. So help build trust, not only with our customers, but also our executive leadership and even within our own IT department. And that's big, right? Having these type of numbers are huge for people to understand that you are, you are enterprise and you're leading the charge in your area and you are taking account these type of things. Also, one of the things about GIS that we had was before GIS, a lot of people, people used it, but it was more of, it wasn't like general population as much, right? People use it for specific needs. Well, now it was general population going there to get information during COVID. And so the usage just exploded. But what also exploded was the scrutiny of the data, right? So I know we had about five situations that, and I would keep counting these, of where there was a data discrepancy. And we had, I want to say we had two where uh, the public actually found a data discrepancy, uh, but there was also three of them where we found them ahead of time and then notified the public of those data discrepancies. 
But if you notice how much data we were pushing out and only have five data discrepancies is huge. And my favorite tweet uh, from Data Guru, and I believe at the office, was uh, me of Maricopa County GIS department was a K-pop band. So it was really cool to see people recognizing our great work and taking that. Also, we would read some of the articles and they had some suggestions in there that we were looking to try to implement to help them out for that because they was like, hey, great if you could show this. We're like, well, we didn't think about it that way. So, you know, we discussed those opportunities there. So it was great to not only, you know, have them appreciate that work, but also get some of that feedback. Now, one of the, one of the stories of this, there was, a, there was a nice discussion about when we first, the school dash, who was gonna use the school dash board when it first came out. And if, I didn't show it here because you could go on the county site and see it. I'm pretty sure a lot of you have. But one of the big things is we use Google Analytics on everything because I want to know who was using it. And one of our uh, architects, who's the chief architect now, she found about, about this uh, data studio that Google had, which is free, that goes along with your analytics. So we had a nice open discussion about who's going to use the site. And there was a there's both sides. One side was like, everybody's going to use it. The other side was like, only the school administrators were going to use it. And that's who the site should be geared to were the school administrators. And they were going to access it mostly through their desktop. And we're like, yeah, we don't believe that's going to be the case. So we, we designed it to the where, where it is today. But then we also took the time to make sure we, it worked properly on the mobile. And we did some enhancements after it rolled out. But once we were able to put this out there, what it helped us do is at the bottom right-hand corner, device type, it helped, it helped other people understand that, yeah, anytime you put anything to the public on the web, overwhelmingly people are probably going to use their cell phones along with the desktop, but their cell phones. So it has to be good and cell phone ready. There was a lot of application rollouts of things throughout the U.S., that it, what things was not ready on the cell phones. And this was 20, you know, 2020, right? If it's not ready for the cell phone out the gate, you're gonna have a lot of problems down the line and phone calls and emails. So you, you had to prepare for that, no, no matter how, what the things was. Also that helped with that trust, right? Because we were saying that there's gonna be potentially a lot of mobile users when this came out, it verified that we knew we, you know, we knew the, the, the community, we knew the public. So trust us when we're in the meetings working with you that this is gonna happen. Also it helps to understand like how people are using it. On the second page of this, which I didn't show, it shows the, the most frequently times the actual application is clicked on and taken advantage of, like during what times of the day. So that helped us when we we're doing updates, you know, whether it was a server or a service or whatever, or even the app, like, okay, don't do it during that time. That's our heaviest hit times. And so that really helped us take into account that for the customer. One of the things that we was also, uh, our chief architect was also able to put in, uh, put together was the workflow. So we'd worked with public health on the different things of getting the data. Now, you may not notice, but throughout the US, you know, you have the electronic data exchange that people have been talking about for a long time ago and data going from hospitals, to the state and the federal government and everybody being to share that, but it, it's kind of like broadband project. It really hasn't expanded to like pharmacies and to doctor's offices and everything because everybody's using their own little systems. Well, COVID really shined a light on, if we had that, we would have been way more prepared if we had that. But because we didn't, there was a lot of data sharing that was happening, you know, through FTP, through say, you know, uh, Excel documents through different older fashions of ways that hopefully we can avoid moving forward with a lot of these new monies coming in from the federal government. So with our school dash is we got the data, you can see the orange was the GIS manual processes, right? As we were learning the processes, we're gonna put it there. Cause all you, a lot of folks see is the front end work, right? Which is great. Oh, you rolled this out in two weeks. Well, they don't know you spent 10 hours every day to roll it out in two weeks, right? So, so we wanted to be able to highlight like, hey, we understand process and workflow, not only just making a great app, but we understand how to get there, right? So it took us a little bit to automate this only because there was changes happening weekly from the federal government to the state to us. 
So we didn't want to automate it right away, but once we did, we were able to then automate it very nicely. As you can see here, to make it look like that, right? Now that helped because the person didn't have to understand the whole process to make sure if somebody had to go take time off or got sick, we could have somebody back them up real easily and they can know how to do certain things in a different process we was running without having to understand the intricacies of the data, right? Which is what you had to do on the manual process side. And so we were able to do a lot of that behind the scenes as we things moved along during the process. Now, part of this that came out with the school data was one particular uh, app was they would then review the data. It would take about you know, approximately like two hours for them to review the data each week to show whether a school was open or closed, uh, open uh, learning scenario was either hybrid or it was on, on you know, they're gonna be on site or totally remote. Well, they were looking at initially how you know, through Excel documents. So we're like, okay, we need to give them something where they can quickly see it really quickly because we need those two hours back, right? As things ramped up, you doing two hour data review, that was prime real estate hours that we wanted to get back and give back to the customer. So the team was able to put this dashboard together that allowed them to review all the different changes in the different, uh, you know, cities, uh, elementary school districts and everything within like 15 minutes. And they could also see that from week to week, there was a specific formula of with red, yellow, and greens that would change the overall learning scenario. And they could easily see whether the formula worked or if there happened to be a special circumstance in a formula. Like we thought we believe the formula is going to work this way. And this one school district had a special circumstance. We're like, oh, we didn't account for that. Then we can go in and make that adjustments to account for it moving forward and then it wouldn't impact everybody's decision-making. And that was critical for a lot of uh, parents and uh, just our citizens understanding that. Also, what was cool is having people in the industry, like, you know, I'm going to the school, to pick up my daughter and hiring a parent or a uh, actual uh, administrator say they were using the site and it was extremely helpful. Like, you don't always get to hear that in GIS that somebody you know was actually using something you did and it was very helpful to them. And we were hearing that a lot. And like I said, that's why I always said that this was, even though it was a very difficult time for everybody, it was one of the best times of my career of showing, showcasing how awesome our GIS team was, how we could you know, be geared up for the challenge and also how public health was doing such a great job, right? Now everybody don't get to see everything public health does every day, but here you can really see it and us working together, if I was able to pick again and do it again, I definitely would do it again. One of the also, one of the applications that we rolled out, and I have a couple more slides and then we can get to questions, uh, was the PPE distribution. And this was delivering, you know, PPE to, uh, you know, long-term care facilities, schools that we had never done that, right? The county had never done that on a wide, a wide scale like that. So we were able to, Put this together in about a week and the team also learned a valuable lesson in sometimes during the crisis you have to roll out things that are not totally all the way there right in gis we like to test double check and make sure it's perfect before it goes out but we all had to get comfortable with releasing things that wasn't as perfect but adjusting on the fly and and that was uh something i know that one i'm gonna keep with me for life as well as i know our team members will be able to take that and get even better. And this was one. Originally, it worked great in the iPhone, but didn't work in Android. And we found out some data we were using, they were using an older type service that caused the app to not like it in the Android. But it was okay in the app, in the, in the iPhone. So we were able to adjust that and then do that. And literally, person in the office would be able to work with a delivery person in the field, tell them where to pick this up, where not to, you know, where to drop it off. And then we would track that and then they were using their cell phones to do it and they could check in and out, like check out for lunch or they're not working today and we could track it. Now, one of the great things of all this that I hope everybody on the call will do is as it, you know, as we flatten the curve, like the young lady said before, and it gets to the point where, you know, it's very flattened, we take all this great data and analyze it to see how we can improve next time. Because there will be a next time, right? 
This isn't going to be a one-time shot. There will be another type next time. And so the opportunity for us is to make the next time a blip on the radar. So I hope that we all take a lot of these tools and data and really look at that and really highlight areas where we can definitely improve. Uh, this one right here was our COVID planning dashboard which some of you guys may have seen uh, in your different areas. You had something similar uh, for that. And uh, we were lucky that we had a person on our team that worked with somebody that was colorblind. And so this works great for folks that are colorblind as well. And like I said, presentation matters, right? When you got executives looking at your data, if you want them to believe that your data is good, then the presentation has to look good. If it doesn't look good, then they're going to question if the data is good. And so our team did a great job of putting that together and designing that, uh, making it. We also had a situation where people was wondering, like in the central region here, if for whatever reason we wasn't planning well for people that were in the urban community. But as you know, in phase one, that was mostly people that are elderly or a certain, you know, 65 and up. Well, they lived in different areas of town. Plus, we had them go into the, the hospitals to actually get the vaccine. So that means that that zip code, those zip codes would be higher. So it really helped um, the county paint that picture for the public. I was like, no, we're not discriminating. Well, this is this is what it looks that way. And then here's our plans to really grow those numbers in those areas that may not be as high as uh, as they should be. And so it worked out extremely well, right? When you're looking at that data to make those division decisions. Uh, and then we got this slide and one other one. This one had nothing to do with GIS whatsoever, but this is the most, the most funny story that I love to tell. And uh, one of our folks, uh, Shiloh, she was in a meeting with some of the, the, the public, public, uh, public health folks and emergency management. And they were talking about the fatality management and how, you know, of course, we, you know, people that don't claim their loved ones, we have to store them um, and then put them through the process. Well, the thing was, this is fake data, so don't worry. So the thing was, is to do that, we had to get these coolers. And once we got these large coolers, a cooler couldn't get over 45 degrees or the, the you know, person would decompose. And if it got, you know, too cold below 32, that they would get frostbite. Either one was a bad situation. And also if a cooler was having malfunction, we wanted to have it. So we was talking to them initially and, you know, initially they didn't know that you could use like, you know, as an iPad or a cell phone. So they were gonna go manual initially to track the temperatures that was coming on the coolers. And so we were able to get two 10 inch iPads and, and the biggest discussion was, well, who's gonna pay the bill on the, the actual, um, you know, getting for the Verizon, right? So you can get the internet because where they were located was Wi-Fi wasn't very good. And so the GIS teams, we were able to step up and cover the cost so they had these two iPads and they would do that. And then we was able to automate the back end when it hit, you know, over 45 degrees, then an email would get sent out to the right people, even if it was 2 a.m. And then they would go look and validate that the cooler was fine. If it wasn't, then move the, the people uh, or uh, get somebody to come out and actually work on the cooler to fix it. So that was so awesome to be able to use the GIS for that. Now, people always ask me like, well, for GIS, should you have used GIS for some of these different tasks or was it better IT tools or better tools? Well, the thing was is, right, during that time period, not only did you have to know the tool, you had to roll it out and be able to do, like the young lady said before, the triage on the tool and then somehow show it graphically in a dashboard. And a lot of times you only had like a week to be able to do that. And then the more tools you created, you had to be able to handle the operational support. So because we were very well versed with our partners and on the applications and the tool set in GIS, it was easier to do those to stop the bleeding. And then we also had this great data. So if they end up going to a different system in the future, guess what? We can move that data to the new system and they can take advantage of that. So that's why we didn't spend, we, did, we spent time on looking at systems, but we didn't do analysis paralysis. And so management tips that I have from a culture standpoint would be during a situation like this or just all the time, there was times where I had to be the bad guy, which means that our team is working with the customer. They're trying to tell them, hey, this is the way you want to go. And the customer kind of wants to do that, but kind of don't. 
but we want to make sure because if we go too far down that road, right, we're going to have to redo all the work. So, you know, then they would come to me and say, David, look, can you talk to them? And then I would talk to upper leadership and get them on our side or at least get them to understand, like, if we go down here, we have to redo this. And we, you know, time is critical right now. So can you, can you trust us, you know? And initially we had to do some of that, but as we got through the, through the pandemic moving forward and they got to trust us really well, we didn't have as much as that. Also as a leader, you got to protect your employees from yourselves, from themselves. Cause we had some employees that would work all times of the hours of the day. And it was awesome. They put everything into it, but at the same time, doing that takes a mental toll. And we had, we, we didn't start really well managing the mental uh, toll on our employees as much as we should have, but we got way better at toward the you know, middle and at the end. And now we have things in place to make sure that we, we, we focus on that first. Nobody in the world knew the mental toll, right? We had folks that would come to work and them working was their actual uh, interaction with people, right? When they went home, they didn't have anybody. They have a pet or a loved one coming to work with their, uh, their interaction. And so having that just removed all of a sudden impacted people mentally very, for a very lot. So hey, we David. didn't really do that. This is Teresa. Yes. We're at our time limit. So if I can have you wrap up in one minute and everyone will just email the questions to you. Okay. You. Sorry guys yeah, about no the, the questions. Uh, I would like to say just be concise and make decisions uh, during that time. You know, you don't want to be on the fence. Uh, being on the fence is the worst place to be. Also, we did a good job of promoting uh, the things that we did. Uh, don't waste a crisis because by doing the promotion, uh, promoting of that, we were able to move things forward with the team. We were able to get more staff resources. Also, we were able to give raises to folks uh, to keep them on the county team. As you may know now, you know, GIS is very popular uh, in the industry and it's hard to find quality folks. So, and that was it. Uh, here's my email. You can definitely email me questions or give me a call and, uh, or as well as send them to Teresa. And uh, I will be able to answer those for you. Thank you for having me today and have a great day. Thank you so much, David. Definitely loved hearing from you. I'm glad to still see you in the GIS community, even though it's not Maricopa. Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, folks that are still listening in on the call, uh, both Nicole and David's emails are in the chat. So feel free to send them any questions. I think there's just so much information to go through that, you know, a lot to unpack there and, and definitely worth our time having you both here with us today. Um, with that being said, if you could take the survey along the right hand side of your screen for us, uh, based on the presentations and how this session went, we definitely look at those and use that for future events. Uh, this session is, has been recorded and it will be available on this, on this page, um, in the next hour or two. So, um, again. Thank you, everybody, for attending and for presenting, and have a great rest of your day.